turn over to the book of Jonah. And so, kids, I know you know who Jonah is, and so I'm going to be asking you questions later about this lesson to see if you're listening. But uh, turn over to the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. Before we begin, have you ever heard that phrase that not even God himself could do that? When I hear that, uh, I, I think to the Titanic, maybe you remember an article says, uh, when the British ship, the Titanic, steamed out of Southampton, bound for New York on April 10, 1912, it was the largest and most sumptuous luxury liner that had ever sailed. It was a monument to the promise of technology and to Victorian elegance. Magnificently appointed with oriental carpets and crystal chandeliers, it was thought to be unsinkable. That phrase, unsinkable, the article says, became notorious. The phrase was originally practically unsinkable, but eventually it was just unsinkable. On top of that, someone claims to have heard the ship's captain, Edward John Smith, say that even God himself couldn't sink this ship. See, the confidence was so high that the owners and the builders, as they were building the Titanic, rejected some of the plans that called for as many as 64 lifeboats. They wanted to have 64 lifeboats. That was in the plans, but, but they felt so confident in the, the structure of this huge ship, they didn't need that many, so they only kept 20. The boats would only accommodate about half of the 2,228 people that were on board. Of course, in one of history's great ironies, the article says the Titanic sank on its stage voyage after colliding with an iceberg off the banks of Newfoundland. More than 1,500 people died in the accident. You know, we hear phrases like that a lot. Not even God himself. Sometimes we hear people use God's name in vain. We hear people use God's name in a vain and, and, and a worthless way, essentially. Just coming off the, the tip of your tongue, just letting it fly like it's nothing. And honestly, we've heard it so much that we've gotten to the point where it doesn't even strike a difference in our brain. Right? It's, it's just one of those things that we hear now and it, and it goes on. One of the most disrespectful ways, I think, that we can show that disrespect to the God of heaven. How often do you hear people use God's name in vain? How often do you hear people talk about God in a disrespectful way? I, I, I think specifically about, and, and some people don't even realize what they're doing, but sometimes, pe sometimes people, when they're even praying to God or, or when they're talking about God using phrases like the man upstairs and and different stuff like that. And it's like, do you really realize, do you understand what you're doing? This is the God of heaven that we're talking about. And, and we're going to get into that a little bit later on. I, I thought about Jonah, okay? Because ultimately, we can disrespect God in more, than, in more ways than just using his name in vain. In more ways uh, of, than just... Calling him the man upstairs, maybe, or in more ways of saying, well, hey, not even God himself could break through this. Jonah, you see, was a Jew. He was one of God's chosen people. And in Jonah chapter 1, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, uh, the son of Amittai, that's how I'm going to say that word, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. So you remember Jonah was supposed to go and preach to Nineveh. God specifically called Jonah to do that, right? But see, that wasn't in Jonah's plans. Because ultimately, we read on, it says, uh, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them away from the presence of the Lord. Now why would Jonah do this? Well, see, the people of Nineveh weren't Israelites, right? So the people of Nineveh were not Jews. And so ultimately, he, he was prejudiced. He was prejudiced in his heart. He, God was 
saying, go preach to them that they might be saved. You go, I'm going to tell you and show you exactly where to go, and I'm going to be with you. And, and Jonah says, nah, you know, nah, it's not really what I want to do. Ultimately, Jonah uh, had hate, hatred in his heart. I mean, if you consider the fact that God was willing to save these people, and Jonah just completely disobeyed what God had commanded him. And what I think is the greatest thing, of course, we use this story as, as uh, a way, it's one of the best stories that we can teach children, right? Because they're like, what? A great fish swallowed a man? He lived there for three days in the belly of this fish? Are you kidding me? No doubt. But I think more than anything, we see the disrespect that Jonah had for his father, for the God of heaven, the God who had done everything for Jonah, the God that had created him. He disrespected him blatantly, just, just disobeyed and went the other way trying to get away from him. But again, we see God's power. Verse 4 says, The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up, and the other people on the ship were like, What is going on? Who has done something wrong? Okay? And eventually, what did they do? They cast lots to see who had landed on landed on Jonah, and they said, All right, you got to go. you got to go. You're the reason... This storm is happening right now because you have disobeyed the God of heaven. And so Jonah's thrown into the sea. Verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. You know, all I can think about is what was going through his mind. I mean, literally, when you have the God of heaven... That, that you have studied about, studied about your entire life, right? You're a Jew. You are one of God's chosen people. And, and, and you've heard the prophets. You, you've studied. You've been in it. Uh, you've lived it. And, and you have this God who directly comes to you and tells you to do something. And you turn. It just blows my mind. The disrespect that Jonah showed to the God of heaven. God showed his power. He said, I'm going to show you. And so verse 17, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And uh, chapter 2, he, he prayed to the Lord as God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. I cried, and you heard my voice. And he goes on, and, and, and it's, just a, it's just a powerful message in my mind because of it, it just shows the disrespect that, that God's created people have for him. How often do we use God's name in vain? How often do we disrespect God? And maybe it's because we haven't even <coughs> thought about it. Maybe you've come in this morning. We've been talking in our uh, our. our young adult class on Sunday mornings about the way that we're supposed to worship God and, and how that it is important, John uh, chapter 4, 24, to, that we must worship God in what? In spirit and in truth. And we've talked about, you know, you know what good does it do if I worship God uh, according to the Bible and I sit down and I, I uh, maybe mumble the words that we're singing and, and call it, hey, I've sung, that's what God expects me to do. Right, and, and there was a prayer that was led, and I bowed my head and said, Hey, I said my prayer, but if my heart is not in it, my mind is not in it, and I, emotionally I'm not there worshiping the God of heaven, it's vain, it's useless, and it's disrespectful. If I come to, to worship God on, on a Sunday morning, it's almost a slap in the face when I sit in that pew and say, You know what? I'm going to act like I'm here so other people can see me, but I'm going to, I'm going to play on my phone. You know, because it is more important for me in this one hour that we're in here worshiping, it's more important for me to check my Facebook. 
Facebook. It's more important for me to just check my Snapchat or check the score of some game that's going on. Or you know what? It's more I, I, I can't get my mind focused because I don't care that much. Ultimately, that's what we're saying. And the disrespect that we have to say, God, I, I know, you know, I'm a Christian. I know that I need to be here. I know that you command me to worship you on the first day of the week, but I'm not going to be able to be there all the time. You see, because I've got other stuff going on. Are we, are we serious? We're willing to tell the God of heaven, hey, I've got, I've got other stuff that's more important to me. Ultimately, that's what we're doing. And, and how do you God. And so what I want to do this morning is I, I want to look at some ways that we're different. Because I honestly think that sometimes we need a reality check. Because when we get to be like Jonah, or when we get to get these start getting these ideas in our head that honestly we just don't think about it anymore, it just becomes not a big deal. Right? Because I, I'm so used to disrespecting God in one way or another that I just don't even think about it anymore. And before you know it, you may have been here Sunday morning, but you hadn't worshipped God. In fact, all you've done is slapped him in the face and said, you know, I know this is what you want, but I'm not willing to give you the reverence and the respect that you deserve on the first day of the week like you've commanded me to. We need a reality check. Because I'm going to tell you something. God is greater than you and I. And God's will is greater than our will. And we need to realize that sometimes. Number one, the point that I want to make is God is the all-powerful creator. And we are the helpless created. Because I think sometimes if we just let our heads swell and we, we stick our chest out and maybe not even mean it to sometimes, but we focus on what we want rather than what God expects and what His will is. Genesis 1-1 in the beginning, God... What did God do? The kids could tell you, I guarantee it. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. They know God created the heavens and the earth. Did you create it? Absolutely not. You know that, right? This is common sense. But we, we take that too lightly sometimes. This is God that we are here worshiping. The one who created the heavens and the earth. Colton Red Force, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. If you're not there, you can look at that. Colossians chapter 1, and in fact, we'll start a couple of verses back. He is the image, this is Paul speaking uh, specifically about Jesus here, but he calls him the image of the invisible God, Jesus being God, the firstborn of all creation. It says, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We, I, we act like this is not existent sometimes. In the way that we treat our God. Acts chapter 17, I hope you'll turn there with me. Acts chapter 17. Paul and Silas are in Thessalonica here in, uh, in chapter 17. They, they, they start in Thessalonica, they go on to Berea, and then Athens. And look in verse 22 through 31. Now Paul's in Athens at the time, and he's preaching. And it says in verse 22, Paul, standing in the midst of the Arapagus, look this word up for you, and, well, for me too, it was uh, in ancient Athens, a hill on which uh, met the highest governmental council and later judicial court. So you got to imagine, all right, Paul is before some prime time people right now, okay? Some of the, some of the big honchos, right? The, the, uh, the, the high, highest governmental council that he is before right now. And listen to what he says. He said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I pass along and observe the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. He says, so, so he gets to these people and, 
and they had been, you know, offering these sacrifices to these different gods, and they said, hey, why don't we do one to this unknown god just in case, right? You know, maybe we're forgetting one, we're leaving one out. Hey, let's just go to the grounds and say, hey, we're going to have this to the unknown god just in case. So Paul says, hey, I'm here to tell you, look in verse uh, 24. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man. See, already he's trying to prove to them the uh, almighty power of the God of heaven and the deity of the God of heaven. He's like, your gods are here in man-made temples. The God that I serve would not be here. He is the one that created us, the one that created uh, the way that we were able to have this temple. He said, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gave, gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Do we forget this sometimes? Do we act like we have something to offer God, like God, you know, uh, we're doing something good or special for him? Paul's, Paul's telling him, he's like, nor is he served by human hands as though he needs to. Do you think God seriously needs anything I have to offer him? No. He's the God of heaven. He's the Almighty, the greatest. He doesn't need anything that I would ever be able to offer to him. I can't offer anything worthy that he would need, okay? But sometimes we sure act like it, don't we? And the way that we worship and the way that we act and the way that we talk and the way that we do things, oh, we act like God needs, he needs my worship. He goes on, he says, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the, all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him, yet He is actually not far from each one of us. Man, it's an awesome God that we serve. Psalm 8. I think this is one of Paige's favorite passages. Psalm 8, verses uh, 1 through 4 there. He says, O Lord, uh, David, writing the Psalm, Psalm 8, 4, uh, 1 through 4. O Lord, our Lord, how... Majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength because of your foes to steal the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You see on the flip side. See, our God, He's the all powerful creator. But on the flip side, you and I, we're ultimately helpless, right? We are helpless. We're dependent upon God. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 The Lord God formed the man. Listen, listen to how man was formed, okay? Because I think this really shows how low we actually are, especially compared to the God of heaven. The Lord God formed the man of what? Dust from the ground. We were formed from the dust of the ground. And sometimes we act like we are better than God. Are you kidding me? Sometimes we get it in our minds that, that hey, you know what? I know what God's will is, but ultimately I don't care. That's what we're saying when we choose to directly disobey God, just like Jonah did with Nineveh. God told Jonah, you go to Nineveh and you preach to them so that they might be saved. And Jonah says, you know what? I, I know that's your will, but my, my way's better. I don't think they need it, God. Huh. The Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of blood, and the man became a living creature. We would not be here without the Almighty infinite, all-powerful creator. We are the helpless created. And we are helpless to the point that without God, obviously we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't have the help that we have. We wouldn't have the things that we have and enjoy on this earth. Number two, God is immortal and we are not. Right? We are not. Deuteronomy chapter
chapter 33, verse 27, if you'd like to look there. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27. The eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. And he thrust out the enemy before you and said, destroy. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17 says, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God is forever. He's eternal. Right? And us, in the form that we are in right now, what's going to happen one day? We're not going to live in this present body that we are in, this physical body that we have right now forever, right? Now, we do know that God made us in His image, as we see in Genesis. And I'm so thankful that He did, that He made us and created us with the soul, and that we might live for eternity in heaven one day. God is mortal. We are mortal. We are dying. Genesis chapter 3 Verse 19, we talked about just a moment ago, God formed us, He created us from the what? From the dust of the ground, right? Dust of the ground. Genesis chapter 3, verse 19 says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to what? Eventually, we're going to return to that same ground that we were created by. Yet sometimes we try to live like nothing will ever happen. You know, we talk specifically about, you know, teenage boys a lot of times. They live like that. It's never ending, right? I'm here to say that I, I think if, if we're not careful, our attitude might prove that at any age we might think that. That we are better than God in the things that we do. James chapter 4. You can look over in James chapter 4. I love the book of James. So practical, simple. It just kind of tells it how it is. You know what I'm saying? I like that. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend the year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, here, here it is. You boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows the right thing to do and uh, fails to do it, for him it is sin. See, that's the issue sometimes. We boast and we boast and we boast. We talk about all the things that we're going to do, forgetting and leaving God out of the picture. It says, what is your life but a mist? Number three, God is from everlasting to everlasting, very similar to the last point we made. Uh, but man, see, there's a time for us, right? There's a time in which we are born, and notice what we will read. Psalm 41, verse 13 why don't you go ahead and turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verses 8 through 10. And I'm going to notice while you turn there, Psalm 41 verse 13 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, says from everlasting to everlasting. That's the God that we serve. Revelations 22 verse 13, maybe you remember this, we sing it in songs. says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last the beginning and the end. That is God, the God of heaven. Now, 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 10 says, But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day, and this blows my mind, okay? I can't understand it. And, and he says that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. But is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, and the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And, and so, as you see, uh, it just, it, I literally can't really comprehend 
the fact that to the Lord, to the God of heaven, he is not bound by time because everything we know is, is according to time here, right? Man, if we didn't make a timeline and, and every day we didn't have a schedule, I don't know what we would do, you know? Let me tell you something. You don't want to not have a schedule with middle school students, all right? Sometimes you're looking at that clock and you're like, eh, the time's break. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we live by schedules. Everything we do, we, we try to plan it out. And, and, and so we are bound by time. And, and ultimately, God is not. He's everlasting to everlasting man, though, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 1 to 2 says, For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. There will be a time. There will be a time in which we will die. Physically, we will pass away. And thanks to our God, the God of heaven, the God that we're talking about today, he has blessed us with the opportunity to live on. God is, number four, the Holy One. This will be the last one we look at this morning. Um, we've got several more points that we'll talk about, contrasting the differences between God and man. Again, I think sometimes we need a reality check, and we need to examine, we need to think about in our lives, <coughs> maybe I'm not living the most respectful way to the God of heaven. And so maybe sometimes we, we just take it too lightly, and we forget that, that we are serving this almighty creator, that we are serving... This, this, uh, this God who is immortal, everlasting to everlasting. And number four, he is holy. He is holy. If you look in uh, Revelations chapter 4, verse 8. Revelations 4, verse 8 says, The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they uh, never cease to say this, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. He is perfect. He is clean. He is pure. He is holy. Yet on the flip side, you and I, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and uh, fallen short of the glory of God, and 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46 actually says, uh, if they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin. We make mistakes. We mess up. We sin against the God of heaven. However, he does not. He's perfect. He's pure. That's the God that we serve. And see, even in that, okay, even in our disrespect, even in our disobedience, even in our sin, even when we make mistakes, God still loves us. And God is still waiting for us to, to, to come back and, and give him the reverence that he deserves in our lives, obeying his will. We had the opportunity this morning. I appreciate your attendance. Uh, well, I appreciate your attendance uh, for sure your attention as well this morning. We had the opportunity, uh, the Lord's invitation, it's always open, and, and sometimes, sometimes we let ourselves go, you know, and if we're not careful, we can, and, and that's what sin does to us, right? If we're, if we're not careful, we don't take hold of that sin, and, and, and we don't repent and get it out of our lives, it takes control. And so it can lead us down a, a very dark path separated from God. And maybe you're in that uh, specific situation uh, this, this morning. And just know that you have so many here who love you so much and that would pray for you uh, on your behalf. Maybe you're not yet a Christian. You have the desire to, to you know, begin showing God that and giving God that respect, that reverence that he deserves. You can do that. We can help you with that this morning as well. Won't you come as we stand and we sing the song of meditation? And it's so why will you
had two come forward this morning, and uh, we'll, we'll start with uh, Miss Charlie Ellis has come, and she just said that there's some things that uh, she's done in, in her life that she's, she's not proud of, uh, that she knows has been disrespectful to God, and she wants to be sure that she's on the, the right page with God, no doubt, and that, that she is right with God, and that she is giving Him the, the respect that He deserves, and so we're so thankful for her willingness. I'll tell you, it's it's hard. It's hard to, to, to yourself, you know, accept and decide, hey, you know, I've got to make this right. So we appreciate her courage for sure, and uh, we love her so much, and we're going to pray for her in just a minute as well as uh, we'll let Norman come up and one last Justin. Justin comes forward, young man, single young man who got the world in front of him. And he just asked for prayers for the congregation to, to help him uh, live better, be better, be a better servant uh, of God. And we just love him and, and know the, the world attacks us all, but, but a young man who's trying to, trying to do right and trying to do good and trying to hang in there, uh, the devil's just... Uh, just right at his heels. And, uh, we just thank Justin so much for his courage, for his uh, spiritual attributes that he has shown uh, within his life here at Skyline. And uh, he just wants the prayers of his family here. Uh, let's, let's pray, please. Father, we thank you so much for uh, uh, Charlie and so much for uh, Justin. Can we just pray, Father, that you'd help each one of them as, as they strive to, to serve you. And know, Father, that uh, you have forgiven them of their sins because of their repentance, because of their tender hearts. And I ask, Father, that you'd be with each of them as they serve you. We pray, Father, that you
Corinthians chapter 11, beginning with verse 23. For I have received, for I have received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whoso shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that drinketh and eateth, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. And in conjunction with what we just heard in this wonderful lesson from Jonathan, well, here we have an opportunity not to be disrespectful. Lord Supper is, is a part of worship just as much as singing and praying and, and all the other things that we do. And right now, at this moment, we have the opportunity to put the cares of the world from our minds and to concentrate on this part of the worship, being the Lord's body. Yeah. Thank you for this day. Just thank you for this
this cup and what it represents. And just thank you for sending your son to die upon that cross. And just please bless this cup, for we know that it represents Christ's, body, or Christ's blood that was shed on that cruel cross at Calvary. As we take of it, please help us show respect to you and respect what this represents. Please help us take of it in a manner that be well pleasing in thy sight. We listen to
Father, help us to remember that, uh, that when we speak thy name, that we are speaking greatness uh, like the world has never seen. Help us to remember that thou art the creator, the one who made this all with a single uh, spoken word. Father, help us to remember uh, that uh, how truly great uh, thou art and only uh, uh, one that is called reverend. Father, help us now to, to uh, keep ourselves lowly uh, in all phases of life, but especially before thee. Help us to never forget that it is on thee upon all things depend. Father, we appreciate such lessons like we've heard uh, this morning. And we are thankful uh, for lessons like that to remind us, Father, who is who is great. Father, we are indeed thankful for the two that have uh, been restored and, and strengthened this morning uh, through repentance. And we know it is thy will that all men uh, should not perish but, but repent and turn. And we know the angels in heaven rejoice each and every time one returns back into the fold. Father, help us as we go into our classes now. Be with the teachers uh, that have prepared lessons. Help them teach their lessons in such a way that, uh, that the students will uh, be enlightened, that they may be learned, and that they may uh, gather strength and truly come to know, honor, and respect the God of heaven, the great I Am. We are so very thankful for the Son, uh, that, thy Son, that, that came to this earth and give us all hope through uh, remission of our sins through uh, that sacrifice that was given upon 